I'm excited about the series, The Way of Escape. I always get excited about what I'm preaching, you know, and that's not a commentary on how good a preacher I think I am. It's because I get immersed in the Word uh, in preparing these sermons. And so when I get up here, it's like, uh, you know, I need an alarm clock to stop me or something. Uh, but basically, the way of escape, uh, again, is our subject. This is number four in the series. And of course, uh, you know, that's good news. It tells us that there's no blind alley in God. Nothing you ever confront in your life is an obstacle that you have to yield to. There is nothing that can stop the unfolding plan of God for your life except you. Nothing else out there that can do it. And that alone is good news. Amen. Well, let's look at our basic text for the series. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, which tells us, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer or allow you to be tempted, tested, or tried above that you are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape. Say that. A way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Good news. No blind alleys in God. Just for the benefit of anybody that hasn't heard any of the previous messages, let me remind you that the word temptation, unlike the normal religious traditional view, doesn't just mean an enticement to sin. That's the way many of the expanded translations render the word temptation, an enticement to sin. It is that. Because the enemy's sole purpose is to push you away from the word of God. Sin is nothing more than taking your life on a path uh, contrary to the word of God. And that's the enemy's purpose for you. As we read in James chapter one, verses two and four, when temptation, tests, or trials come your way, it is for the purpose of contradicting the word of God in your life and causing you to question the validity of that word. He says it's about the trying of your faith. The enemy is smart enough to know that he can't alter God's plan, which includes blessing. God's will for you is always synonymous with blessing. And he can't alter that plan without altering what you believe. You're a free moral agent. God doesn't impose blessing on you. He's surely not gonna let the enemy impose death or cursing on you. The enemy has to put pressure on your belief system in the hope that you'll begin to waver and be double-minded. Oh, I don't know if it's right or I don't know if it's wrong because the double-minded man, the wavering man, receives nothing from the Lord. That's what he's after. And so, you know, we're told to rejoice when we fall into divers, temptations, tests, or trials. Knowing this, that it's not God behind it, but it's about putting pressure on your belief system. So, if you let patience have her perfect work, the word patience means to cheerfully endure and be constant in what you believe. Let patience have a perfect work. You'll pass through this season of hard times into a place called perfect and entire wanting nothing. So a key to understanding 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is when he says there is no temptation taken you such as is common to man is to go beyond the usual traditional understanding of an enticement to sin. The Greek word parosmos uh, literally means and is defined in the Strong's as a putting to proof by the experience of adversity. He's going to use adversity, 
a word used in the Greek New Testament and rendered affliction, hardship, trouble, tribulation. He's going to use hardship, contrary circumstance to what you are believing for. He's going to use that to put pressure. The word thalipsis for adversity, the first definition is pressure. He's going to put pressure on what you believe by confronting you with something that is contrary with what you've decided to believe from the word. You decided to believe that it's necessary to tithe as an example. But you go several months and there are no obvious windows of heaven being opened in your life and you begin to question, do I really need to tithe? Is it really God's will to tithe? Perhaps that was Old Testament, not new. One question after the other. You're having a battle in your body. You've prayed for uh, the manifestation of healing because you've decided to believe, as the word says, by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. If you're born again, you were healed. Back at the cross of Christ, he put sickness and disease under not just his feet, but your feet. And yet here I am sick. And I've prayed. I haven't seen any change, any difference. Had hands laid on me, nothing happened. So maybe it's not the will of God to heal. He is putting pressure on your belief system. And he has the legal right to do that for the balance of this dispensation. The word calls Satan the prince of the powers of the air. He's not locked up in hell somewhere. He is in the atmosphere surrounding this earth with the demonic host. And he's there to see if he can push you off of your faith. He's the God of this world this natural arena of life, meaning he has the legal right intended for Adam, intended for humanity, before humanity bowed its knee to him and that authority granted unto him to manipulate this natural arena, circumstance, people that don't know any better, to put pressure on your belief system. And so that's what this deal is all about. He's saying that when adversity comes in any form, it could be an enticement to sin, but I think just as likely it's some sort of hardship, tribulation, affliction, difficulty, counter to what God says you have to experience as a covenant partner with him. He's putting pressure on it. And now, you know, uh, God's reminding us some thing, of some things. These things are all common to man. You're not in it by yourself. But understand, God's never gonna let you be confronted with something you aren't capable of standing against. So don't ever feel like you've come to the end of your rope. The key is understanding that there is a way of escape in here. A way of escape from what? From the adversity that he's bringing to bear in your life. There is a way of escape. Just like the Bible says, if you don't get weary in well-doing, that means basing your life on the principle of God's word, then in due season you'll reap if you faint not or quit. If you don't quit, Quit what? Quit believing the word, then in due season, you'll reap your harvest. And so, you know, uh, we can see that this way of escape uh, is a path that we are to walk that'll take us out of this particular hardship. A way that he specifies, that he has prepared for you. We just need to identify it. Last Sunday, we said one of the principal signposts along your highway of escape, however you want to call it, is something the Bible refers to as the peace of God. 
We saw in Romans that we are to follow after peace. And that's the same God that told you there's a way of escape. So he's telling you that peace is always going to be an indicator to you that you're on the road to escaping the circumstance you face. And so, you know, peace is a subject that probably should be preached on multiple Sundays because it's not preached enough, at least in our stream of ministry. I mean, many of you know there is that peace, but the, kinds of, the kind of emphasis we should put on it is, uh, I think, granted by revelation of peace as a wall of protection against whatever the enemy's trying to accomplish in your life. That's the terminology that's used in uh, the New Testament in Philippians chapter four. Your heart and your mind can be garrisoned about, some translations use the word garrison, uh, to guard, to protect, you know, garrisoned about by peace. It's like a wall that is erected to keep the enemy's weapons he's fashioned against you from prospering. He can't penetrate it. When you've got the peace going for you, he cannot penetrate it. A hugely important subject. And so he says to follow after that peace. And of course we know that uh, one source of peace is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. He's defined as something other than food and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. He is peace. In the person of the Holy Spirit, you are indwelled by both the Father and the Son. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. So you have peace resident within you just like you do the whole kingdom of God. The Bible tells us that the whole kingdom of God is within you. Meaning that when you're born again, you become a citizen of a new kingdom, a different kingdom than an earthly kingdom. A kingdom is defined by a recognition of the authority of the king. That's what makes you a citizen recognition of the authority of the king. You're a citizen of the king kingdom. It is within you to the degree that you recognize the authority of the king and align your life with the laws that govern that kingdom, the operation of that kingdom, or we could call it spiritual law, you'll see the kingdom manifest on this earth. That's the way the word reads. It isn't just something for you to experience when you die and go to heaven. Jesus prayed that way. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as well as in heaven. And so we are to see the kingdom manifest. That doesn't just mean that you get other people saved and become participants in the kingdom. That means kingdom truth can be demonstrated through your life. The glory of the king can be demonstrated through your life. I'm getting off track here, but that kingdom is within you. And everything that as citizens of that kingdom should define our perception of life. And understanding that peace has to have a priority consideration is one of those perceptions you have to shape. Amen. And of it being an impassable wall of defense between you and your enemy. And that's, there's still going to be hard places coming, but it's got nothing to do with the peace that is within you and that you can live by. We're to follow after that peace. And that's the same as following after the Holy Spirit. But there's, there's two places that peace has to be addressed within. 
One is understanding that when you're born again, you become a temple of the Holy Spirit and that capacity to live by peace is within you, just as the whole kingdom uh, privilege you have as a citizen, which would be healing, provision, deliverance as a citizen of the kingdom of God. That's your right. That is the will of God for you. But it's all in here until you take the steps to get it out here. And so when we address the matter of peace, yes, you need to be saved. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that potential to live in that special place of peace is within you. But there are a lot of believers who never live in that peace because the second consideration has to do with getting it out into this natural arena. And your mind is the key. Your mind, without going into a lot of scripture, I've taught about this in depth before, but your mind, your thoughts, your mind is like a filter for anything that comes in or goes out. And the key to beginning to see kingdom manifestations in this natural arena is getting the right things happening between your ears, in your mind. And so as we read last week from um, Philippians chapter four, from verses six and seven, talking about the importance of prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Prayer is defined as with thanksgiving when it involves supplication. Never go to God crying and moaning and groaning and oh Lord, gotta help me out. Always go to him with a thankful heart. Thankful for what he's already done Thankful for what he promises he will do. And then that prayer with thanksgiving is the way you let your request be made known unto him. Doesn't come out as whining that way. It comes out in faith. You're thanking God for what he said he's gonna do. And so essentially, the result of that is the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep, or garrison about your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's the heart. But the mind has to be involved as well, and verse eight deals with the mind. Verse eight and verse nine say, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, Now, I'm not going to study each of these words in depth, but you should. You should think about them, meditate on them, because this defines how you should be thinking. He goes on to say, if there be any virtue, which means power, and if there be any praise, think on these things. If there's going to be any power in your life, even though your heart Your spirit, the real you, is a reservoir of power as you begin believing the word. To release that power, your mind, like a valve, has to be turned to be in agreement. And he's telling us how to think for that to be true, but as it relates to peace, he goes on to say in verse nine, those things, what things? Things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely of a good report. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And what's the result? The God of peace shall be with you. So peace is a twofold consideration. Born again, filled with the Spirit. The Prince of Peace lives within you in the person of the Holy Spirit. But to get things uh, in this natural arena to change, to get the truth of who you are in Christ manifest in this natural realm, you're gonna have to do something about your thinking. 
And you know, all of the other items, truth, honesty, just, pure, lovely, are wrapped up in the term good report. Because that's what this is. You've already won. Even if you feel like a loser, if you're in Christ, you have already won in every single area. Let me ask you something. Is COVID-19 a good report? Why are you thinking about it so much? Just consider these kinds of thought patterns that invade your mind. Consider them in light of whether or not it's a good report or not. Now, that doesn't mean you can ignore their reality. Because there is physical law and there is spiritual law. Physical law says there are things that are rational and appropriate for you to do to contribute to your successful walk in life. You don't ignore your rational capacity. That's not what we're being told. Instead, you, you know, don't cross the street on a red light and by faith believe you're not gonna get hit. You'll get run over for sure. You don't jump out of a tree and believe that your faith is strong enough to overcome gravity, which it is, but that's just stupidity gone to see. And so basically, you live responsibly in this world. You know, if there are things you can do to make yourself less um, likely to contract COVID-19, you should. You should wash your hands. You should wear a mask if you feel concerned because you're in a demographic that is more at risk than others, then you know, there are natural steps you should take. That doesn't mean you aren't a person of faith, but it's appropriate to live responsibly in both arenas. What we are being told is that we think on, we cultivate a thought life that is based on what we just read, is cultivating a thought life that will only magnify fear instead of faith. We have talked often about 2 Corinthians 10, 4, casting down vain imaginations and every thought that exalts itself against Christ. We need to do that. And when a thought comes that doesn't fall in one of the categories we just read about in verse 8, of Philippians 4, we need to get rid of it. We need to cast it down. Now, all of this has been introductory. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, you know, but that's just the, the way it is. Um, because the real subject matter of the message today that I really want you to leave with is how do you become a person? Because when I first heard that I had to cast down every thought and vain imagination that exalts itself against Christ, that's all I did all day, every day. I'd get a thought cast down, you know, uh, 30 seconds later, it's back again. I get it cast down, it comes back again and again, and it brings a couple of others with it that I shouldn't be thinking. And I cast them down. You know, I exhausted myself. The first time I actually tried to live that way and, and take care of my thought life, recognizing the importance of it in the Word, it drove me up a tree. And I just kind of uh, shrugged to God and said, this isn't possible. Well, of course, God doesn't tell you to do something if you can't do it. And taking care of individual thoughts like that are important. But where we have to graduate, how do you get to a place where you don't have to do that all of the time? You think right more often than you think wrong. 
You know, it's a rare occasion that you have to take a thought and get rid of it. How do you, how do you get to that place? Because that's the only place you can really productively live. You can't spend all of your waking hours getting rid of negative thoughts. They're out there. You know, the enemy is going to circumstantially prompt you to think about this, think about that. You're constantly casting down thoughts. How can you get beyond that and start thinking right? Well, the Bible says you have the mind of Christ, meaning that when you're born again, the real you has the capability of thinking exactly like Jesus thinks. Now, he demonstrated during his ministry on this earth what you can do. Too many people see the ministry of Jesus being a demonstration of the power of God, you know, period, and don't extend that thought uh, to a real man. Because he laid down his deity. He didn't do what he did as God. He did what he did as a spiritually alive human being. Amen. And therefore, we're told we can do the same works and greater. So he demonstrated during his ministry on this earth how to live, not just the, the miraculous that can flow through you into this natural arena, but how to see life how to view reality, how to understand why certain things happen and other things don't. He was an example of all of that. And the way Jesus thought and perceived life is available to you if you're born again and you are in Christ. But there's one little thing you've got to do in order for that to occur got to do if you want to walk through life with the mind of Christ. Instead of having to search it out and wonder about this or that, how can you live this way without having to cast down every vain imagination that pops into your head? You still have to do that. But how do you live a life where that isn't a constant thing, where you just think God thoughts? Isn't that wonderful? Well... I'm glad you asked. We can look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 17 and 18. And, you know, these are not new things for most of you, but like Peter, I'll not fail to put you in remembrance of a very important truth that sometimes perhaps we haven't verbalized in a particular way. Verse 17 says... For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now, this is the Apostle Paul talking. He said he had experienced light affliction. They were only momentary. This is a man that had been stoned how many times? Shipwrecked, persecuted in ways we can't imagine. And he calls his experience a light affliction, momentary at that. It's all a matter of perception, church. And this isn't just saying to us, your earthly life is but a vapor, and therefore anything you experience in this earthly life is light and momentary on a scale of eternity. That's true. And that if you maintain your stand, your belief, your faith in the Word of God, believing that Jesus has redeemed you from hell unto heaven, that someday when this life that is but a vapor, that is but light and momentary, in comparison to the eternal life that awaits you, then you can truly say, yes, you know, it worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That is true. But it has a here and now application just as sure as perfect and entire wanting nothing is here and now and not simply in the eternal ages to come. Because he defined it as a 
trial of your faith. You're not going to need any faith in heaven. Everything's there. You're not going to have to uh, rely on your faith, changing natural circumstance. It's all there in heaven. So it is for this life. The kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven is the will of God for now. And so there is a way to make your hardship light. I don't care how bad it may sound in the natural, but in terms of your perception, it's nothing. The terminal doctor's report, it's nothing. You know, whatever it is you have faced, it's nothing. It's light, and it's going to be gone just like that and then to experience on this earth an exceeding, oh, man. It says, worketh for us a far more exceeding. And it is eternal, but it begins now. Your eternity is present tense, today onward forever. Your eternity begins now, and it's an exceeding, an eternal weight, weight of glory. The goodness of God. Things that so far exceed your ability to ask or think, you can experience it now. And whatever the report that was bad is that you received, it becomes truthfully light to you and momentary in duration. But it says this only occurs in verse 18, while, say while, while, we look not at the things which are seen. Don't be looking. And you say, well, how can you avoid looking? Well, the word look, if you get out your strongs once more, is to spy out, to consider to examine, in other words, to mull that seen circumstance over and over again in your mind. You can't do that. But you do do that regarding the things that are seen. That's what you spy out. That's what you give your consideration to. That's what you examine. That's what you mull over and over again. And he said, if that's, and the reason that needs to be the case, because the things that are seen in this natural world we live in are temporal. The Greek word means subject to change. Subject to change. That's what faith does. When you believe more strongly in who you are in Christ than whatever natural circumstance you may be facing defines your life. You're not defined by natural consideration. And when you believe that the real you is in Christ, that's the dominant truth that you live by, it changes the temporal arena. That's what faith does. That's why there's an exceeding greatness of power to usward who believe. And it's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. It will resurrect any dead circumstance you're dealing with, any dead relationship, any dead uh, bodies, you know, or bodies on their way to death. It'll redeem any bankrupt business, any failed financial endeavor. That resurrection power is applied by your faith to change the seen realm. Amen. And he points that out when he says the things that are seen are temporal. They're subject to change. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. And your eternity starts today, not when you die. Each day, is the next day of eternity for a believer. And it's the unseen realm that dominates. That's the realm revealed by the Bible. 
Boy, I'll tell you what, if everybody just got that, oh, the Bible is not a religious book that simply describes what some group called Christians believe. You mean it's a revelation of the unseen realm? That's it. And this is the only place that the truths which live in that realm can be discovered and found. That's the way the Word of God presents itself. And so, you know, um, we know that this is a revelation of the unseen realm. Then this is what we spy out. This is what we look at. This is what we examine. And here I want to go to the Passion Translation of these two verses because it says it in a way. You said, I still haven't uh, shared the topic of the sermon today. <laughs> Second Corinthians 4.17 says, we view our slight short-lived troubles in the light of eternity. <laughs> slight short-lived troubles. Is that what you want? We see our difficulties as the substance it produces for us an eternal weighty glory far beyond all comparison. We should stop there for a moment. Go back to that. We should stop there for a moment and say that this will change your view of difficult places you're in. Jesus was perfected by the things that he suffered according to the word of God. Well, the things that we deal with that we would call hardship, tribulation, things that are counter to the will of God for our life will actually benefit you in the long run. And they will. If you understand this truth, just like the Bible says about the human body, you can understand, according to 1 Corinthians 12, truths about the spiritual you, the real you, the body of Christ at large by looking at truths regarding our physical body. And we know that for you to gain strength in your physical body, you have to experience resistance. That's what resistance training is all about. It builds muscle tissue and it produces strength gains for you in your natural body. In much the same way, resistance on a spiritual plane the hardships and difficulties you experience. And it's, it's a good thing once you learn to cheerfully endure because you know the outcome of all of this. These hard places we experience in this natural life, the resistance on a spiritual level has the same effect. You will make strength gains. The end result, when that light momentary trouble, short-lived trouble is past is that it will produce for you an eternal, eternity begins today, weighty glory far beyond all comparison. God will be resting on you and his glory seen through you in ways that wouldn't otherwise be true. If you hadn't stood through that thing that, that was a hardship to you. But all of this, instead of while we look not, the Passion Translation says it's all because we don't focus our attention on what is seen, but on what is unseen. The title of the sermon is Focus. Because if you want to live in a place that doesn't require you to cast down vain imaginations every 30 seconds. If you want to be able to tap in to the mind of Christ and live in a place where you see life through the eyes of Jesus and you think God thoughts, it all comes down to the focus of your attention. Focus is huge. Your focus is on COVID. You'll be filled with fear, anxiety, cares about the, uh, the condition our society seems to be crumbling into. You'll be filled with 
Uh, you know, you see unjust things happen like George Floyd, and you'll be filled with anger and animosity and rage. You shouldn't ignore these things. Like I said, we have natural responsibilities in this life, but that cannot be your focus. Your attention, your examination, your study, your meditation, your attention has to be focused not on what's seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but the unseen realm starting with today is eternal. It's easy to see when your focus is wrong because if you're dealing with fear and trepidation and anxiety and, oh man, things are looking dark and you live in a dark place, you are focusing on the wrong thing. You're focusing on the scene realm. Now, there are responsibilities in the scene realm that we need to pursue. I'm not suggesting we don't do that. But you can't focus your attention on it. If you feel peace wearing a mask, wear a mask. But then get off of it in your mind. And focus, focus your attention on what God says. He'll say things through his word that are true for all of us. He'll say things to you as an individual by the Holy Spirit that are only true for you. Focus is huge. I learned some things about focus and the power that is in it, keeping your focus where it belongs. If your focus is something, then you haven't got time for these other little thoughts, these other little feelings to come your way. If your focus is right, and I learned, uh, you know, dealing with some pain issues. I've not had a lot of pain uh, in my life, meaning physical pain now, uh, you know, but there have been a couple of occasions when, you know, I can remember, it's been a long time since I've had a headache, but I can remember having a bad headache. You know, I didn't know how I was going to get through the next hour until whatever I took for it kicked in and minimized it a little bit. But then I got distracted, got my focus somewhere else. I forgot about the headache. And when I remembered the headache, it was gone. Well, there was another example in my life. Uh, I've always run all of my life, and uh, I don't always do it for the right reason. Lynn and Brother Copeland have pointed out that I just like to run enough so I can eat what I want and uh, <laughs> not necessarily the right reason. And that's not necessarily true. I am also interested in cardiovascular well-being and fitness. And so I've always run. And I run a long way. I run 10 miles. That's not to impress anybody. You wouldn't be impressed if you knew what my pace was, you know. Um, <laughs> takes me an hour and 20 minutes to run 10 miles. But my goal is to get my heart rate up to 150 or so or higher and keep it there for better than an hour. And that produces cardiovascular fitness and burns a lot of calories too, so I can't eat more. But that's a side benefit, <laughs> not the primary motive. But a long time ago, um, you know, I found a place when we lived in Golden Valley to run beside the railroad tracks that led out of town because there was a, an old track bed right next to the live tracks or a little off from it uh, that was a perfect running surface. It was crushed gravel. Uh, you know, the, the ties and the rails had been removed. So it was just like a ready-made running path. I didn't have to put up with cars or honking horns or uh, uh, dogs that chase you. I used to carry a bat with me. Well, I won't, I'm getting off subject. But anyway, um, so this was probably 30 years ago. I'm running along this 
uh, this track bed, and uh, I'd run five miles out, five miles back, never see a car. Perfect place. And, um, but you had to be a little cautious because there were some irregularities in the bed every now and then. Uh, and so I'm, I made a misstep, and I twisted my left knee really bad, really badly. I could hear something crunch in there. And, man, I limped back, and my knee hurt so badly. And, uh, you know, I'm confessing my healing and believing my healing. But, you know, after a month, I'm still hobbling around on the platform. And it really was a hindrance to my call. I mean, because it hurt all the time. Went to a sports medicine guy. He told me I'd torn, I don't remember what it was, maybe the meniscus, I don't know what it was. But it was cartilage that had been torn and was putting pressure on a nerve bundle that made the pain constant all the time. And uh, so I lived with it, you know, for about a month and, you know, finally prayed, spent enough time with the Lord. I felt like he told me to go run on it again. Don't ever do something like that because it's stupidity unless you're convinced God told you to do it. But I really felt that strongly. And, you know, I remember Lynn telling me as I walked out the door, this is the stupidest thing you've ever done. <laughs> because in the natural, it was. So I got down to my spot there and I started to run and it hurt so badly uh, I, didn't, I didn't know if I was going to be able to, to do this, really. But I had brought along my Walkman. I always carried my Walkman, had a couple of earplugs stuck in. And I had Brother Hagen on. And guess what I was listening to? You can guess. Yeah. El Shaddai yeah. and Kenneth E. Hagen and God who is more than enough. And I used to get so stirred by his preaching that message uh, you know, that I'd be preaching along with him and thinking of ways that I could modify it a little bit and use it in one of my services. And, and the next thing I knew, because it took me about 10 minutes to really get into it, an hour and 10 minutes or so had passed. I was finished running. I hadn't thought about the pain in my leg. I was so, and don't just call it distracted. I was spying out you know, truth that was exactly uh, the remedy that my, my leg needed. And so focused on it, man, I was into it, preaching with Brother Hagen, and at the end of the run, the pain was gone. And it never came back. I've never had a problem with that knee. And basically, I went back to the sports medicine people, and he just kind of shook his head. He was puzzled. I told him, you know, it was the power of God. Didn't look like he believed it, but uh, it, was, it was a place where I realized the importance of focus. As badly as that hurt me, if getting my focus on the right thing could have that effect, then I realized that our daily challenge, more than casting down every thought that is contrary to the knowledge of Christ, uh, and, you know, let's just change our focus and we'll begin to pick up his perception of life, his perception of reality. And this takes, some, this takes an effort too initially. It might take you a couple of weeks to start getting that pattern going where uh, you focus where you should. Not just on the written word of God, but on the will of God for your life. I mean, there are things that, oh my. Well, a few extra minutes. Focusing on things about your life that define the will of God for you. And getting absorbed in what God's called you to do. I've also realized over the years that I could have something bothering me, something out here that wanted to worry me, some kind of difficulty we're dealing with that, uh, you know, I'm kind of wrestling with. But when I would start preparing my sermon for the weekend, that two-day period, was, I didn't even think about that stuff anymore because I'm focused on my call. I'm focused on the Word of God. 
And I even forgot what I was worried about there for a couple days. So it just says to you the power of focusing your attention on the right thing. Yeah, it might be the written word. It might be what the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart and letting him elaborate that to you and help you <clears throat> get the vision clear and the planning down and working on uh, maybe the numbers for this idea that you feel like is of God. And, you know, the next thing you know, you've, what was that I was worried about? It's just gone. Are you hearing me this morning? Because life really is about your focus. You don't like your life like it's being lived right now. If you're dealing with fear or anxiety or worry, if things are looking darker than they are light, your focus is wrong. And you're on the path at least the touch of death, if not literal death, and cursing, as opposed to the path of life and the associated blessing that defines for you God's purpose and God's will. Just closing very briefly, I feel like Nikki Kinn is a wonderful example of this. All he does is eat, think, drink, and sleep evangelism. That is all he does. That's what he's called to do. He's been our staff evangelist for 35 years and is the reason that we have prayed with 1.6 million people to receive the Lord in this ministry. And you know, you know something else about Nikki? He's never got a bad word about anything or anybody. He doesn't have time for that stuff. He's thinking about the next time he's on the streets, he'll do this or that, or shaping his delivery a little differently. Or, you know, he's thinking about and focused on the call of God for his life. And he's a happy camper. He doesn't have time for the silliness out there that the enemy tries to bring to his life. What a great way to live. And it's all about focus. And so I want to leave you with that thought. Keep your attention focused where it belongs. The written word or the will of God for your life as revealed by the Holy Spirit. And all of the multitude of ways that that focus will impact your relationships, your physical well-being, your uh, your finances, your children, your grandchildren. My goodness, I just realized I am positioned to perhaps have a great-grandchild. I don't know how that's possible. That isn't a, that isn't a, a kind of a, an offhand announcement of anything at all, but I just realized, you know, I got a couple of married grandchildren so that possibility is real. I don't know how I feel about that. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. It does. So keep your focus where it should be. Your affliction will be light and momentary and your life will exude an exceeding weight of glory. Hallelujah.